Chapter 7 Possibilities Luke sat in his bedroom. At lunchtime he had sustained an interrogation by Mrs. Anstruther as to what flowers he had had in his garden in the Mayang Straits. He had then been told what flowers would have done well there. He had also listened to further talks to young men on the subject of myself by Lord Whitfield. Now he was mercifully alone. He took a sheet of paper and wrote down a series of names. It ran as follows. Dr. Thomas, Mr. Abbott, Major Horton, Mr. Ellsworthy, Mr. Wake, Mr. Jones, Amy's young man, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, etc. And then he took another sheet of paper and headed it Victims. Under this heading he wrote, Amy Gibbs, Poisoned, Tommy Pierce, Pushed Out of Window, Harry Carter, Shoved Off Footbridge, Drunk, Drugged, Dr. Humbleby, Blood Poisoning, Miss Pinkerton, Run Down by Car. He added, Mrs. Rose, Old Ben, and after a pause, Mrs. Horton. He considered his lists, smoked a while, then took up his pencil once more. Dr. Thomas. Possible case against him. Definite motive in the case of Dr. Humbleby. Manner of latter's death suitable, namely scientific poisoning by germs. Amy Gibbs visited him on afternoon of the day she died. Anything between them? Blackmail? Tommy Pierce. No connection known. Did Tommy know of connection between him and Amy Gibbs? Harry Carter? No connection known. Was Dr. Thomas absent from Witchwood on the day Miss Pinkerton went to London? Luke sighed and started a fresh heading. Mr. Abbott. Possible case against him. Feel a lawyer is definitely a suspicious person, possibly prejudice. His personality... Florid, genial, etc., would be definitely suspicious in a book. Always suspect bluff, genial men. Objection. This is not a book, but real life. Motive for murder of Dr. Humbleby. Definite antagonism existed between them. H. defied Abbott. Sufficient motive for a deranged brain. Antagonism could have been easily noted by Miss Pinkerton. Tommy Pierce? Latter snooped among Abbott's papers. Did he find out something he shouldn't have known? Harry Carter? No definite connection. Amy Gibbs? No connection known. Hat paint, quite suitable to Abbott's mentality. An old-fashioned mind. Was Abbott away from the village the day Miss Pinkerton was killed? Major Horton. Possible case against him. No connection known with Amy Gibbs, Tommy Pierce, or Carter. What about Mrs. Horton? Death sounds as though it might be arsenical poisoning. If so, other murders might be a result of that. Blackmail? N.B. Thomas was doctor in attendance. Suspicious for Thomas again. Mr. Ellsworthy. Possible case against him. Nasty bit of goods. Dabbles in black magic. Might be temperament of a bloodlust killer. Connection with Amy Gibbs. Any connection with Tommy Pierce, Carter? Nothing known. Humbleby? Might have tumbled to Ellsworthy's mental condition. Miss Pinkerton? Was Ellsworthy away from Witchwood when Miss Pinkerton was killed? Mr. Wake? Possible case against him. Very unlikely. Possible religious mania? A mission to kill? Saintly old clergyman likely starters in books, but as before, this is real life. Note. Carter, Tommy, Amy, all definitely unpleasant characters. Better removed by divine decree? Mr. Jones. Data, none. Amy's young man. Probably every reason to kill Amy, but seems unlikely on general grounds. The etc. Don't fancy them. He read through what he had written. Then he shook his head. He murmured softly, Which is absurd. How nicely Euclid put things. He tore up the lists and burned them. He said to himself, This job isn't going to be exactly easy. Chapter 8
Dr. Thomas Dr. Thomas leant back in his chair and passed a long, delicate hand over his thick, fair hair. He was a young man whose appearance was deceptive. Though he was over thirty, a casual glance would have put him down in the early twenties, if not in his teens. His shock of rather unruly fair hair, his slightly startled expression, and his pink and white complexion gave him an irresistibly schoolboyish appearance. Immature as he might look, though, the diagnosis he had just pronounced on Luke's rheumatic knee agreed almost precisely with that delivered by an eminent Harley Street specialist only a week earlier. Thanks, said Luke. Well, I'm relieved you think that electrical treatment will do the trick. I don't want to turn a cripple at my age. Dr. Thomas smiled boyishly. <laughs> I don't think there's any danger of that, Mr. Fitzwilliam. Well, you've relieved my mind, said Luke. I was thinking of going to some specialist chap, but I'm sure there's no need now. Dr. Thomas smiled again. Go if it makes your mind easier. After all, it's always a good thing to have an expert's opinion. No, no, I got full confidence in you. Frankly, there's no complexity about the matter. If you take my advice, I'm quite sure you'll have no further trouble. You've relieved my mind no end, Doctor. Fancied I might be getting arthritis, and would soon be all tied up in knots and unable to move. Dr. Thomas shook his head with a slightly indulgent smile. Luke said quickly, Men get the wind up pretty badly in these ways. I expect you find that. I often think a doctor must feel himself a medicine man, a kind of magician to most of his patients. The element of faith enters in very largely. I know. The doctor says so is a remark always uttered with something like reverence. Dr. Thomas raised his shoulders. If one's patients only knew, he murmured humorously. Then he said, You're writing a book on magic, aren't you, Mr. Fitzwilliam? <laughs> now, how did you know that? exclaimed Luke, perhaps with somewhat overdone surprise. Dr. Thomas looked amused. <laughs> oh, my dear sir, news gets about very rapidly in a place like this. We have so little to talk about. It probably gets exaggerated, too. You'll be hearing I'm raising the local spirits and emulating the Witch of Endor. Rather odd you should say that. Why? Well, the rumour has been going around that you had raised the ghost of Tommy Pierce. Pierce? Pierce? Is that the small boy who fell out of a window? Yes. Now, I wonder how. Oh, of course, I made some remark to the solicitor. What's his name? Abbott? Yes, the story originated with Abbott. Don't say I've converted a hard-boiled solicitor to a belief in ghosts. You believe in ghosts yourself, then? Your tone suggests that you do not, Doctor. No, I wouldn't say I actually believe in ghosts, to put it crudely. But I have known curious phenomena in the case of sudden or violent death. But I'm more interested in the various superstitions pertaining to violent deaths, that a murdered man, for instance, can't rest in his grave, and the interesting belief that the blood of a murdered man flows if his murderer touches him. I wonder how that arose. Very curious, said Thomas, but I don't suppose many people remember that nowadays. More than you would think. Of course, I don't suppose you have many murders down here, so it's hard to judge. Luke had smiled as he spoke, his eyes resting with seeming carelessness on the other's face. But Dr. Thomas seemed quite unperturbed and smiled in return. No, I don't think we've had a murder for, oh, very many years. Certainly not in my time. No, this is a peaceful spot, not conducive to foul play, unless somebody pushed little Tommy, what's his name, out of the window. Luke laughed. Again, Dr. Thomas's smile came in answer, a natural smile full of boyish amusement. A lot of people... Would have been willing to wring that child's neck, he said, but I don't think they actually got to the point of throwing him out of windows. He seems to have been a thoroughly nasty child. The removal of him might have been conceived as a public duty. It's a pity one can't apply that theory fairly often. I've always thought a few wholesale murders would be beneficial to the community, said Luke. A club bore, for instance, should be finished off with a poisoned liqueur brandy. Then there are the women who gush at you and tear all their dearest friends to pieces with their tongues, backbiting spinsters, inveterate diehards who oppose progress. If they were painlessly removed, what a difference it would make to social life. Dr. Thomas's smile lengthened to a grin. In fact, you advocate crime on a grand scale.
Judicious elimination, said Luke. Don't you agree that it would be beneficial? Oh, undoubtedly. Ah, but you're not being serious, said Luke. Now I am. I haven't the respect for human life that the normal Englishman has. Any man who is a stumbling block on the way to progress ought to be eliminated. That's how I see it. Running his hand through his short, fair hair, Dr. Thomas said, Yes, but who is to be the judge of a man's fitness or unfitness? Well, that's the difficulty, of course, Luke admitted. The Catholics would consider a communist agitator unfit to live. The communist agitator would sentence the priest to death as a purveyor of superstition. The doctor would eliminate the unhealthy man, the pacifist would condemn the soldier, and so on. You'd have to have a scientific man as judge, said Luke. Someone with an unbiased but highly specialized mind, a doctor, for instance. Come to that. I think you'd be a pretty good judge yourself, doctor. Of unfitness to live? Yes. Dr. Thomas shook his head. My job is to make the unfit fit. Most of the time it's an uphill job, I'll admit. Now, just for the sake of argument, said Luke, take a man like the late Harry Carter. Dr. Thomas said sharply, Carter? You mean the landlord of the Seven Stars? Yes, that's the man. I never knew him myself, but my cousin, Miss Conway, was talking about him. He seems to have been a really thoroughgoing scoundrel. Well, said the other. He drank, of course. Ill-treated his wife, bullied his daughter. He was quarrelsome and abusive, and had had a row with most people in the place. In fact, the world is a better place without him. One might be inclined to say so, I agree. In fact, if somebody had given him a push and sent him into the river, instead of his kindly electing to fall in of his own accord, that person would have been acting in the public interest. Dr. Thomas said dryly, these methods that you advocate, did you put them into practice in the uh, Mayang Straits, I think you said? Luke laughed. Oh, no. With me it's theory, not practice. No, I do not think you are the stuff of which murderers are made. Luke asked, Why not? I've been frank enough in my views. Exactly. Too frank. You mean that if I were really the kind of man who takes the law into his own hands, I shouldn't go about airing my views? That was my meaning. But it might be a kind of gospel with me. I might be a fanatic on the subject. Even so, your sense of self-protection would be active. In fact, when looking for a murderer, look out for a nice, gentle, wouldn't-hurt-a-fly type of man. Slightly exaggerated, perhaps, said Dr. Thomas, but not far from the truth. Luke said abruptly, Tell me. It interests me. Have you ever come across a man whom you believed might be a murderer? Dr. Thomas said sharply, Really, what an extraordinary question. Is it? After all, a doctor must come across so many queer characters. He would be better able to detect, for instance, the signs of homicidal mania in an early stage, before it's noticeable. Thomas said rather irritably, You have the general layman's idea of a homicidal maniac. A man who runs amok with a knife— a man more or less foaming at the mouth. Let me tell you, a homicidal lunatic may be the most difficult thing on this earth to spot. To all seeming, he may be exactly like everyone else. A man, perhaps, who is easily frightened, who may tell you, perhaps, that he has enemies. No more than that. A quiet, inoffensive fellow. Is that really so? Of course it's so. A homicidal lunatic often kills, as he thinks, in self-defense. But, of course, a lot of killers are ordinary, sane fellows like you and me. Doctor, you alarm me. Fancy, if you should discover later that I have five or six nice, quiet little killings to my credit. Dr. Thomas smiled. I don't think it's very likely, Mr. Fitzwilliam. Don't you? I'll return the compliment. I don't believe you've got five or six murders to your credit either. Dr. Thomas said cheerfully, You're not counting my professional failures. Both men laughed. Luke got up and said goodbye. I'm afraid I've taken up a lot of your time, he said apologetically. Oh, I'm not busy. Witchwood is a pretty healthy place. It's a pleasure to have a talk with someone from the outside world. I was wondering, said Luke, and stopped. Yes? Miss Conway told me, when she sent me to you, what a very, well, what a first-class man you were. I wondered if you didn't feel rather buried down here. Not much opportunity for talent. Oh, general practice is a good beginning.
It's valuable experience. But you won't be content to stay in a rut all your life. Your late partner, Dr. Humbleby, was an unambitious fellow, so I've heard, quite content with his practice here. He'd been here for a good many years, I believe. Practically a lifetime. He was sound, but old-fashioned, so I hear. Dr. Thomas said, At times he was difficult, very suspicious of modern innovations, but a good example of the old school of physicians. Left a very pretty daughter, I'm told, said Luke in jocular fashion. He had the pleasure of seeing Dr. Thomas's pale pink countenance go a deep scarlet. Oh, uh, uh, yes, he said. Luke gazed at him kindly. He was pleased at the prospect of erasing Dr. Thomas from his list of suspected persons. The latter recovered his normal hue and said abruptly, Talking about crime just now, I can lend you rather a good book, as you're interested in the subject. Translation from the German, Kreuzhammer, on inferiority in crime. Oh, thank you, said Luke. Dr. Thomas ran his finger along a shelf and drew out the book in question. Here you are. Some of the theories are rather startling. And, of course, they're only theories, but they are interesting. The early life of Menzhelt, for instance, the Frankfurt butcher, as they called him, and the chapter on Anna Helm, the little nursemaid killer, are really extremely interesting. She killed about a dozen of her charges before the authorities tumbled to it, I believe, said Luke. Dr. Thomas nodded. Yes, she had a most sympathetic personality, devoted to children, and apparently quite genuinely heartbroken at each death. The psychology is amazing. Amazing how these people get away with it, said Luke. He was on the doorstep now. Dr. Thomas had come out with him. Not amazing, really, said Dr. Thomas. It's quite easy, you know. What is? To get away with it. He was smiling again, a charming, boyish smile. If you're careful. One just has to be careful, that's all. But a clever man is extremely careful not to make a slip. That's all there is to it. He smiled and went into the house. Luke stood staring up the steps. There had been something condescending in the doctor's smile. Throughout their conversation, Luke had been conscious of himself as a man of full maturity, and of Dr. Thomas as a youthful and ingenuous young man. Just for a moment, he felt the roles reversed. The doctor's smile had been that of a grown-up, amused by the cleverness of a child. Chapter 9 Mrs. Pierce Talks In the little shop in the high street, Luke had bought a tin of cigarettes and today's copy of Good Cheer, the enterprising little weekly which provided Lord Whitfield with a good portion of his substantial income. Turning to the football competition, Luke, with a groan, gave forth the information that he had just failed to win a hundred and twenty pounds. Mrs. Pierce was roused at once to sympathy and explained similar disappointments on the part of her husband. Friendly relations thus established, Luke found no difficulty in prolonging the conversation. A great interest in football Mr. Pierce takes, said Mr. Pierce's spouse. Turns to it first of all in the news, he does, and as I say, many a disappointment he's had. But there, everybody can't win, that's what I say. And what I say is you can't go against luck. Luke concurred heartily in these sentiments, and proceeded to advance by an easy transition to a further profound statement that troubles never came singly. Ah, no, indeed, sir, that I do know. Mrs. Pierce sighed, and when a woman has a husband and eight children, six living and buried two, that is, well, she knows what trouble is, as you may say. I suppose she does. Oh, undoubtedly, said Luke. You've uh, buried two, you say? One no longer than a month ago said Mrs. Pierce, with a kind of melancholy enjoyment. Dear me, very sad. It wasn't only sad, sir, it was a shock. That's what it was, a shock. I came over all queer, I did, when they broke it to me, never having expected anything of that kind to happen to Tommy, as you might say, for when a boy's a trouble to you, it doesn't come natural to think of him being took. Now, my Emma Jane, a sweet little mite she was, you'll never rear her, that's what they said, she's too good to live. And it was true, sir. The Lord knows his own. Luke acknowledged the sentiment, and strove to return from the subject of the saintly Emma Jane to that of the less saintly Tommy. Your boy died quite recently, he said. An accident? An accident it was, sir. 
cleaning the windows of the old hall, which is now the library. He must have lost his balance and fell from the top windows, that was. Mrs. Pierce expatiated at some length on all the details of the accident. Wasn't there some story, said Luke carelessly, of his having been seen dancing on the window sill? Mrs. Pierce said that boys would be boys, but no doubt it did give the Major a turn, him being a fussy gentleman. Major Horton? Yes, sir, the gentleman with the bulldogs. After the accident happened, he chanced to mention having seen our Tommy acting very rash-like, and of course it does show that if something sudden had startled him, he would have fallen easily enough. I spirit, sir, that was Tommy's trouble. A sore trial he's been to me in many ways, she finished, but there it was. Just high spirits, nothing but high spirits, such as any lad might have. There wasn't no real arm in him, as you might say. No, no, I'm sure there wasn't. But sometimes, you know, Mrs. Pierce, people, sober, middle-aged people, find it hard to remember they've ever been young themselves. Mrs. Pierce sighed. Very true, those words are, sir. I can't help but hoping that some gentleman I could name, but won't, will have taken it to heart the way they were hard upon the lad, just on account of his high spirits. Played a few tricks upon his employers, did he? asked Luke, with an indulgent smile. Mrs. Pierce responded immediately. It was just his fun, sir, that was all. Tommy was always good at imitations. Make us hold our sides with laughing the way he'd mince about pretending to be that Mr. Ellsworthy at the curio shop, or old Mr. Hobbs, the church warden, and he was imitating his lordship up at the manor, and the two undergardeners laughing. When up come his lordship, quiet-like, and gave Tommy the sack on the spot. And naturally, that was only to be expected, and quite right, and his lordship didn't bear malice afterwards, and helped Tommy to get another job. But other people weren't so magnanimous, eh? said Luke. That they were not, sir. Naming no names. And you'd never think it with Mr. Abbott, so pleasant in his manner, and always a kind word or a joke. Tommy got into trouble with him, Mrs. Pierce said. It's not, I'm sure, that the boy meant any harm. And after all, if papers are private and not meant to be looked at, they shouldn't be laid out on a table, that's what I say. Oh, quite, said Luke. Private papers in a lawyer's office ought to be kept in the safe. That's right, sir. That's what I think, and Mr. Pierce, he agrees with me. It's not even as though Tommy had read much of it. What was it? A will? asked Luke. He judged, probably rightly, that a question as to what the document in question had been might make Mrs. Pierce halt. But this direct question brought an instant response. Oh, no, sir, nothing of that kind. Nothing really important. Just a private letter it was, from a lady. And Tommy didn't even see who the lady was. All such a fuss about nothing, that's what I say. Mr. Abbott must be the sort of man who takes offence very easily, said Luke. Well, it does seem so, doesn't it, sir? Although, as I say, he's always such a pleasant gentleman to speak to. Always a joke or a cheery word. But it's true that I have heard he was a difficult man to get up against, and him and Dr. Rumbleby was daggers drawn, as the saying is, just before the poor old gentleman died, and not a pleasant thought for Mr. Abbott afterwards, for once there's a death, one doesn't like to think there's been harsh words spoken and no chance of taking them back. Luke shook his head solemnly and murmured, Very true, very true. He went on, A bit of a coincidence, that. Hard words with Dr. Humbleby, and Dr. Humbleby died. Harsh treatment of your Tommy, and the boy dies. I should think that a double experience like that would tend to make Mr. Abbott careful of his tongue in future. Harry Carter, too, down at the Seven Stars, said Mrs. Pierce. Very sharp words passed between them, only a week before Carter went and drowned himself. But one can't blame Mr. Abbott for that. The abuse was all on Carter's side. Went up to Mr. Abbott's house, he did, being in liquor at the time, and shouting out the foulish language at the top of his voice. Poor old Mrs. Carter, she had a deal to put up with, and it must be owned Carter's death was a merciful release as far as she was concerned. He left a daughter too, didn't he? Ah, said Mrs. Pierce, I'm never one to gossip. This was unexpected, but promising. Luke pricked up his ears and waited. I don't say there was anything in it but talk. Lucy Carter's a fine-looking young woman in her way, and— if it hadn't been for the difference in station, I dare say no notice would have been taken. But talk there has been, and you can't deny it, especially after Carter went right up to his house, shouting and swearing. Luke gathered the implications of this somewhat confused speech. Mr. Abbott looks as though he'd appreciate a good-looking girl, he said. It's often the way, be gentlemen, said Mrs. Pierce. 
They don't mean anything by it, just a word or two in passing, but the gentry's the gentry, and it gets noticed in consequence. It's only to be expected in a quiet place like this. It's a very charming place, said Luke. So unspoiled. That's what artists always say, but I think we're a bit behind the times myself. Why, there's been no building here to speak of? Over at Ashfell, for instance, they've got a lovely new lot of houses, some of them with green roofs and stained glass in the windows. Luke shuddered slightly. You've got a grand new institute here, he said. They say it's a very fine building, said Mrs. Pierce, without great enthusiasm. Of course, his lordship's done a lot for the place. He means well, we all know that. But you don't think his efforts are quite successful, said Luke, amused. Well, of course, sir. He isn't really gentry. Not like Miss Wainfleet, for instance, and Miss Conway. Why, Lord Whitfield's father kept a boot shop only a few doors from here. My mother remembers Gordon Rag serving in the shop, remembers it as well as anything. Of course, he's his lordship now, and he's a rich man. But it's never the same, is it, sir? Evidently not, said Luke. You'll excuse me mentioning it, sir, said Mrs. Pierce. And, of course, I know you're staying at the manor and writing a book, but you're a cousin of Miss Bridget's, I know, and that's quite a different thing. Very pleased we shall be to have her back as mistress of Ash Manor. Rather, said Luke. I'm sure you will. He paid for his cigarettes and paper with sudden abruptness. He thought to himself, the personal element, one must keep that out of it. Hell, I'm here to track down a criminal. What does it matter who that black-haired witch marries or doesn't marry? She doesn't come into this. He walked slowly along the street. With an effort, he thrust Bridget into the back of his mind. Now then, he said to himself, Abbott. The case against Abbott. I've linked him up with three of the victims. He had a row with Humbleby, a row with Carter, and a row with Tommy Pierce, and all three died. What about the girl Amy Gibbs? What was the private letter that infernal boy saw? Did he know who it was from, or didn't he? He mayn't have said so to his mother, but suppose he did. Suppose Abbott thought it necessary to shut his mouth. It could be. That's all one can say about it. It could be. Not good enough. Luke quickened his pace, looking about him with sudden exasperation. This damn village is getting on my nerves. So smiling and peaceful, so innocent, and all the time this crazy streak of murder running through it. Or am I the crazy one? Was Lavinia Pinkerton crazy? After all, the whole thing could be coincidence. Yes, Humbleby's death and all. He glanced back down the length of the high street, and he was assailed by a strong feeling of unreality. He said to himself, These things don't happen. Then he lifted his eyes to the long, frowning line of Ash Ridge, and at once the unreality passed. Ash Ridge was real. It knew strange things, witchcraft and cruelty and forgotten bloodlusts and evil rites. He started. Two figures were walking along the side of the ridge. He recognized them easily, Bridget and Ellsworthy. The young man was gesticulating with those curious, unpleasant hands of his, his head was bent to Bridget's. They looked like two figures out of a dream. One felt that their feet made no sound as they sprang cat-like from turf to turf. He saw her black hair stream out behind her, blown by the wind. Again, that queer magic of hers held him. Bewitched. That's what I am, bewitched, he said to himself. He stood quite still. A queer, numbed feeling spreading over him. He thought to himself ruefully, Who's to break the spell? There's no one. Chapter 10 Rose Humbleby A soft sound behind him made him turn sharply. A girl was standing there, a remarkably pretty girl with brown hair curling round her ears and rather timid-looking dark blue eyes. She flushed a little with embarrassment before she spoke. Mr. Fitzwilliam, isn't it? she said. Yes, I... I'm Rose Humbleby. Bridget told me that... that you knew some people who knew my father. Luke had the grace to flush slightly under his tan. It was a long time ago, he said rather lamely. They, uh, knew him as a young man, 
before he married. Oh, I see. Rose Humbleby looked a little crestfallen, but she went on. You're writing a book, aren't you? Yes, I'm making notes for one, that is, uh, about local superstitions, all that sort of thing. Oh, I see. It sounds frightfully interesting. It'll probably be as dull as ditchwater, Luke assured her. Oh, no, I'm sure it won't. Luke smiled at her. He thought, ah, oh, Dr. Thomas is in luck. There are people, he said, who can make the most exciting subject unbearably boring. I'm afraid I'm one of them. Oh, but why should you be? I don't know, but the conviction is growing upon me. Rose Humbleby said, You might be one of the people who make dull subjects sound frightfully exciting. Oh, that is a nice thought, said Luke. Thank you for it. Rose Humbleby smiled back. Then she said, Do you believe in... in superstitions and all that? Well, that's a difficult question. It doesn't follow, you know. One can be interested in things one doesn't believe in. Yes. I suppose so. The girl sounded doubtful. Are you superstitious? N no, I don't think so. But I do think things come in in waves. Waves? Waves of bad luck and good luck, I mean. I feel as though lately all Witchwood was under a spell of, of misfortune. Father dying, and Miss Pinkerton being run over, and that little boy who fell out of the window. I, I began to feel as though I hated this place as though I must get away. Her breath came rather faster. Luke looked at her thoughtfully. So, you feel like that? Oh, I know it's silly. I suppose, really, it was poor Daddy dying so unexpectedly. It was so horribly sudden. She shivered. And then Miss Pinkerton. She said— The girl paused. What did she say? She was a delightful old lady, I thought. Very like a rather special aunt of mine. Oh, did you know her? Rose's face lit up. I was very fond of her, and she was devoted to Daddy, but I've sometimes wondered if she was what the Scotch call fay. Why? Because, it's so odd, she seemed quite afraid that something was going to happen to Daddy. She almost warned me, especially about accidents. And then that day, just before she went up to town, she was so odd in her manner, absolutely in a dither. I really do think, Mr. Fitzwilliam, that she was one of those people who have second sight. I think she knew that something was going to happen to her, and she must have known that something was going to happen to Daddy, too. It's, it's rather frightening, that sort of thing. She moved a step nearer to him. There are times when one can foresee the future, said Luke. It isn't always supernatural, though. No, I suppose it's quite natural, really. Just a faculty that most people lack. All the same, it, it worries me. You mustn't worry, said Luke gently. Remember, it's all behind you now. It's no good going back over the past. It's the future one has to live for. I know, but there's more. You see, Rose hesitated, there was something to do with your cousin. My cousin? Bridget? Yes. Miss Pinkerton was worried about her in some way. She was always asking me questions. I think she was afraid for her, too. Luke turned sharply, scanning the hillside. He had an unreasoning sense of fear. Bridget, alone with the man whose hands had that unhealthy hue of greenish, decomposing flesh. Fancy. All fancy. Ellsworthy was only a harmless dilettante who played at shopkeeping. As though reading his thoughts, Rose said, Do you like Mr. Ellsworthy? Emphatically, no. Geoffrey, Dr. Thomas, you know, doesn't like him either. And you? Oh, no, I think he's dreadful. She drew a little nearer. There's a lot of talk about him. I was told that he had some queer ceremony in the witch's meadow. A lot of his friends came down from London, frightfully queer-looking people, and Tommy Pierce was a kind of acolyte. Tommy Pierce, said Luke sharply. Yes, he had a surplice and a red cassock. When was this? Oh, some time ago. I think it was in March. Tommy Pierce seems to have been mixed up in everything that ever took place in this village. Rose said, He was frightfully inquisitive. He always had to know what was going on. He probably knew a bit too much in the end, said Luke grimly. 
Rose accepted the words at their face value. He was rather an odious little boy. He liked cutting up wasps, and he teased dogs. The kind of boy whose decease is hardly to be regretted. No, I suppose not. It was terrible for his mother, though. I gather she has six blessings left to console her. She's got a good tongue, that woman. She does talk a lot, doesn't she? After buying a few cigarettes from her, I feel I know the full history of everyone in the place. Rose said ruefully, That's the worst of a place like this. Everybody knows everything about everybody else. Oh, no, said Luke. She looked at him inquiringly. Luke said with significance, No one human being knows the full truth about another human being. Rose's face grew grave. She gave a slight involuntary shiver. No, she said slowly. I suppose that's true. Not even one's nearest and dearest, said Luke. Not even— She stopped. I suppose you're right, but I wish you wouldn't say frightening things like that, Mr. Fitzwilliam. Does it frighten you? Slowly she nodded her head. Then she turned abruptly. I must be going now. If— if you have nothing better to do, I mean, if you could do come and see us. Mother would would like to see you because of your knowing friends of Daddy's long ago. She walked slowly away down the road. Her head was bent a little as though some weight of care or perplexity bowed it down. Luke stood looking after her. A sudden wave of solicitude swept over him. He felt a longing to shield and protect this girl. From what? Asking himself the question, he shook his head with a momentary impatience at himself. It was true that Rose Humbleby had recently lost her father, but she had a mother, and she was engaged to be married to a decidedly attractive young man who was fully adequate to anything in the protection line. Then why should he, Luke Fitzwilliam, be assailed by this protection complex? Good old sentimentality to the fore again, thought Luke. The protective male, flourishing in the Victorian era— going strong in the Edwardian era, and still showing signs of life despite what our friend Lord Whitfield would call the rush and strain of modern life. All the same, he said to himself as he strolled on towards the looming mass of Ash Ridge, I like that girl. She's much too good for Thomas. A cool, superior devil like that. A memory of the doctor's last smile on the doorstep recurred to him. Decidedly smug it had been. Complacent. End of Disc 2 Disc 3 The sound of footsteps a little way ahead roused Luke from his slightly irritable meditations. He looked up to see young Mr. Ellsworthy coming down the path from the hillside. His eyes were on the ground and he was smiling to himself. His expression struck Luke disagreeably. Ellsworthy was not so much walking as prancing like a man who keeps time to some devilish little jig running in his brain. His smile was a strange, secret contortion of the lips. It had a gleeful slyness that was definitely unpleasant. Luke had stopped, and Ellsworthy was nearly abreast of him, when he at last looked up. His eyes, malicious and dancing, met the other man's for just a minute before recognition came. Then, or so it seemed to Luke, a complete change came over the man. Where a minute before there had been the suggestion of a dancing satyr, there was now a somewhat effeminate and priggish young man. Oh, Mr. Fitzwilliam, good morning. Good morning, said Luke. Have you been admiring the beauties of nature? Mr. Ellsworthy's long, pale hands flew up in a reproving gesture. Oh, no, 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 dear me, no, I abhor nature. Such a coarse, unimaginative wench. I have always held that one cannot enjoy life until one has put nature in her place. And how do you propose to do that? There are ways, said Mr. Ellsworthy. In a place like this, a delicious provincial spot, there are some most delectable amusements, if one has the goo, the flair. I enjoy life, Mr. Fitzwilliam. So do I, said Luke. Mens sana in corpore sano, said Mr. Ellsworthy. His tone was delicately ironic. I'm sure that's so true of you. There are worse things, said Luke. My dear fellow, sanity is the one unbelievable bore. One must be mad, deliciously mad, perverted, slightly twisted. Then one sees life from a new and entrancing angle. The lepers squint, 
suggested Luke. Ah, <laughs> very good, very good, quite witty. But there's something in it, you know, an interesting angle of vision. But I mustn't detain you. You're having exercise. One must have exercise. The public school spirit. As you say, said Luke, with a curt nod, and walked on. He thought, I'm getting too darned imaginative. The fellow's just an ass, that's all. But some indefinable uneasiness drove his feet on faster. That queer, sly, triumphant smile that Ellsworthy had had on his face, was that just imagination on his, Luke's part? And his subsequent impression that it had been wiped off as though by a sponge the moment the other man caught sight of Luke coming towards him? What of that? And with quickening uneasiness he thought, Bridget, is she all right? They came up here together, and he came back alone. He hurried on. The sun had come out while he was talking to Rose Humbleby. Now it had gone in again. The sky was dull and menacing, and wind came in sudden erratic little puffs. It was as though he had stepped out of normal everyday life into that queer half-world of enchantment, the consciousness of which had enveloped him ever since he came to Witchwood. He turned a corner and came out on the flat ledge of green grass that had been pointed out to him from below, and which went he knew by the name of the Witch's Meadow. It was here, so tradition had it, that the witches had held revelry on Walpurgis Night and Halloween. And then a quick wave of relief swept over him. Bridget was here. She sat with her back against a rock on the hillside. She was sitting bent over, her head in her hands. He walked quickly over to her, lovely springing turf, strangely green and fresh. He said, Bridget? Slowly she raised her face from her hands. Her face troubled him. She looked as though she were returning from some far-off world, as though she had difficulty in adjusting herself to the world of now and here. Luke said, rather inadequately, I say, you're, you're all right, aren't you? It was a minute or two before she answered, as though she still had not quite come back from that far-off world that had held her. Luke felt that his words had to travel a long way before they reached her. Then she said, Of course I'm all right. Why shouldn't I be? And now her voice was sharp and almost hostile. Luke grinned. I'm hanged if I know. I got the wind up about you suddenly. Why? Mainly, I think, because of that melodramatic atmosphere in which I'm living at present. It makes me see things out of all proportion. If I lose sight of you for an hour or two, I naturally assume that the next thing will be to find your gory corpse in a ditch. It would be in a play, or a book. Heroines are never killed, said Bridget. Or no, but— Luke stopped, just in time. What were you going to say? Nothing. Thank goodness he had just stopped himself in time. One couldn't very well say to an attractive young woman, but you're not the heroine. Bridget went on. They're abducted, imprisoned, left to die of sewer gas or be drowned in cellars. They're always in danger, but they don't ever die. Nor even fade away, said Luke. He went on. So, this is the witch's meadow. Yes. He looked down at her. You only need a broomstick, he said kindly. Thank you. Mr. Ellsworthy said much the same. I met him just now, said Luke. Did you talk to him at all? Yes. I think he tried to annoy me. Did he succeed? His methods were rather childish. He paused and then went on abruptly. He's an odd sort of fellow. One minute you think he's just a mess, and then suddenly one wonders if there isn't a bit more to it than that. Bridget looked up at him. You felt that too? You agree, then? Yes. Luke waited. Bridget said, There's something odd about him. I've been wondering, you know— I lay awake last night, racking my brains, about the whole business. It seemed to me that if there was a killer about, I ought to know who it was, I mean living down here and all that. I thought, and I thought, and it came to this, if there is a killer, he must definitely be mad. Thinking of what Dr. Thomas had said, Luke asked, You don't think that a murderer can be as sane as you or I? Not this kind of a murderer. As I see it, this murderer must be crazy. And that, you see, brought me straight to Ellsworthy. Of all the people down here, he's the only one who is definitely queer. He is queer. You can't get away from it. Luke said doubtfully, There are a good many of his sort. Dilettante, poseurs. Usually quite harmless. 
Yes, but I think there might be a little more than that. He's got such nasty hands. You noticed that? Funny, I did, too. They're not just white, they're green. They do give one that effect. All the same, you can't convict a man of being a murderer because of the color of his flesh tints. Oh, quite. What we want is evidence. Evidence, growled Luke. Just the one thing that's absolutely lacking. The man's been too careful. A careful murderer. A careful lunatic. I've been trying to help, said Bridget. With Ellsworthy, you mean? Yes, I thought I could probably tackle him better than you could. I've made a beginning. Tell me. Well, it seems that he has a kind of little coterie, a band of nasty friends. They come down here from time to time and celebrate. Do you mean what are called nameless orgies? I don't know about nameless, but certainly orgies. Actually, it all sounds very silly and childish. I suppose they worship the devil and do obscene dances. Something of the kind. Apparently they get a kick out of it. I can contribute something to this, said Luke. Tommy Pierce took part in one of their ceremonies. He was an acolyte. He had a red cassock. So he knew about it? Yes, and that might explain his death. You mean he talked about it? Yes, or he may have tried a spot of quiet blackmail. Bridget said thoughtfully, I know it's all fantastic, but it doesn't seem quite so fantastic when applied to Ellsworthy as it does to anyone else. No, I agree. The thing becomes just conceivable, instead of being ludicrously unreal. We've got a connection with two of the victims, said Bridget, Tommy Pierce and Amy Gibbs. Where do the publican and Humbleby come in? At the moment they don't. Not the publican, but I can imagine a motive for Humbleby's removal. He was a doctor, and he may have tumbled to Ellsworthy's abnormal state. Yes, that's possible. Then Bridget laughed. I did my stuff pretty well this morning. My psychic possibilities are grand, it seems, and when I told how one of my great-great-grandmothers had a near escape of being burnt for witchcraft, my stock went soaring up. I rather think that I shall be invited to take part in the orgies at the next meeting of the Satanic Games, whenever that may be. Luke said, Bridget, for God's sake, be careful. She looked at him, surprised. He got up. I met Humbleby's daughter just now. We were talking about Miss Pinkerton, and the Humbleby girl said that Miss Pinkerton had been worried about you. Bridget, in the act of rising, stopped, as though frozen into immobility. What's that? Miss Pinkerton? Worried about me? That's what Rose Humbleby said. Rose Humbleby said that? Yes. What more did she say? Or well, nothing more. Are you sure? Quite sure. There was a pause, then Bridget said, I see. Miss Pinkerton was worried about Humbleby, and he died. Now I hear she was worried about you. Bridget laughed. She stood up and shook her head so that her long black hair flew out round her head. Don't worry, she said. The devil looks after his own. Chapter 11 Domestic Life of Major Horton Luke leaned back in his chair on the other side of the bank manager's table. Well, that seems very satisfactory, he said. I'm afraid I've been taking up a lot of your time. Mr. Jones waved a deprecating hand. His small, dark, plump face wore a happy expression. No, indeed, Mr. Fitzwilliam. This is a quiet spot, you know. We're always glad to see a stranger. It's a fascinating part of the world, said Luke, full of superstitions. Mr. Jones sighed and said it took a long time for education to eradicate superstition. Luke remarked that he thought education was too highly rated nowadays, and Mr. Jones was slightly shocked by the statement. Lord Whitfield, he said, has been a handsome benefactor here. He realizes the disadvantages under which he himself suffered as a boy, and is determined that the youth of today shall be better equipped. Early disadvantages haven't prevented him from making a large fortune, said Luke. No, he must have had ability, a great ability, or luck, said Luke. Mr. Jones looked rather shocked. Luck is the one thing that counts, said Luke. Take a murderer, for example. Why does the successful murderer get away with it? Is it ability, or is it sheer luck? Mr. Jones admitted that it was probably luck. Luke continued. 
Take a fellow like this man, Carter, the landlord of one of your pubs. The fellow was probably drunk six nights out of seven. Yet one night he goes and pitches himself off the footbridge into the river. Luck again. Good luck for some people, said the bank manager. You mean, for his wife and daughter? Oh, yes, of course. A clerk knocked and entered bearing papers. Luke gave two specimen signatures and was given a checkbook. He rose. Well, I'm glad that's all fixed up. Had a bit of luck over the derby this year. Did you? Mr. Jones said smilingly that he was not a betting man. He added that Mrs. Jones had very strong views on the subject of horse racing. Then I suppose you didn't go to the derby? No, indeed. Anybody go to it from here? Major Horton did. He's quite a keen racing man, and Mr. Abbott usually takes the day off. He didn't back the winner, though. I don't suppose many people did, said Luke, and departed after the exchange of farewells. He lit a cigarette as he emerged from the bank. Apart from the theory of the least likely person, he saw no reason for retaining Mr. Jones on his list of suspects. The bank manager had shown no interesting reactions to Luke's test questions. It seemed quite impossible to visualize him as a murderer. Moreover, he had not been absent on Derby Day. Incidentally, Luke's visit had not been wasted. He had received two small items of information. Both Major Horton and Mr. Abbott, the solicitor, had been away from Witchwood on Derby Day. Either of them, therefore, could have been in London at the time when Miss Pinkerton was run down by a car. Although Luke did not now suspect Dr. Thomas, he felt he would be more satisfied if he knew for a fact that the latter had been at Witchwood, engaged in his professional duties on that particular day. He made a mental note to verify that point. Then there was Ellsworthy. Had Ellsworthy been in Witchwood on Derby Day? If he had, the presumption that he was the killer was correspondingly weakened. Although, Luke noted, it was possible that Miss Pinkerton's death had been neither more nor less than the accident that it was supposed to be. But he rejected that theory. Her death was too opportune. Luke got into his own car, which was standing by the curb, and drove in it to Pipwell's garage, situated at the far end of the high street. There were various small matters in the car's running that he wanted to discuss. A good-looking young mechanic with a freckled face listened intelligently. The two men lifted the bonnet and became absorbed in a technical discussion. A voice called, Jim, come here a minute. The freckled-faced mechanic obeyed. Jim Harvey. That was right. Jim Harvey, Amy Gibbs's young man. He returned presently, apologizing, and conversation became technical once more. Luke agreed to leave the car there. As he was about to leave, he inquired casually, Do any good on the derby this year? No, sir. Back Clarigold. Can't be many people who back Jujube the second. No, indeed, sir. I don't believe any of the papers even tipped it as an outside chance. Luke shook his head. Racing's an uncertain game. Ever seen the derby run? No, sir. Wish I had. Asked for a day off this year. There was a cheap ticket up to town and down to Epsom, but the boss wouldn't hear of it. We were short-handed, as a matter of fact, and had a lot of work in that day. Luke nodded and took his departure. Jim Harvey was crossed off his list. That pleasant-faced boy was not a secret killer, and it was not he who had run down Lavinia Pinkerton. He strolled home by way of the riverbank. Here, as once before, he encountered Major Horton and his dogs. The Major was still in the same condition of apoplexy, shouting, Augustus! Nilly! Nilly, I say! Nero! 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 Again the protuberant eyes stared at Luke. But this time there was more to follow. Major Horton said, Excuse me, Mr. Fitzwilliam, isn't it? Yes. Horton here? Yeah? Major Horton. Believe I'm going to meet you tomorrow up at the manor. Tennis party. And Miss Conway very kindly asked me. Cousin of yours, isn't she? Yes. Thought so. Soon spot a new face down here, you know. Here a diversion occurred. The three bulldogs advancing upon a nondescript white mongrel. Augustus! Nero, come here, sir! Come here, I say! When Augustus and Nero had finally reluctantly obeyed the command, Major Horton returned to the conversation. Luke was patting Nellie, who was gazing up at him sentimentally. Nice bitch that, isn't she? 
said the Major. I like bulldogs. I've always had them. Prefer them to any other breed. And my place is just near here. Come in and have a drink. Luke accepted, and the two men walked together while Major Horton held forth on the subject of dogs and the inferiority of all other breeds to that which he himself preferred. Luke heard of the prizes Nellie had won, of the infamous conduct of a judge in awarding Augustus merely a highly commended, and the triumphs of Nero in the show ring. By then they had turned in at the Major's gate. He opened the front door, which was not locked, and the two men passed into the house. Leading the way into a small, slightly doggy-smelling room lined with bookshelves, Major Horton busied himself with the drinks. Luke looked around him. There were photographs of dogs, copies of the field and country life, and a couple of well-worn armchairs. Silver cups were arranged round the bookcases. There was one oil painting over the mantelpiece. "'My wife,' said the Major, looking up from the siphon and noting the direction of Luke's glance. "'Remarkable woman. A lot of character in her face, don't you think?' "'Yes, indeed,' said Luke, looking at the late Mrs. Horton. She was represented in a pink satin dress and was holding a bunch of lilies of the valley. Her brown hair was parted in the middle and her lips were pressed grimly together. Her eyes of a cold grey looked out ill-temperedly at the beholder. "'A remarkable woman,' said the Major, handing a glass to Luke. "'She died over a year ago. I haven't been the same man since.' "'No?' said Luke a little at a loss, to know what to say. "'Sit down,' said the Major, waving a hand towards one of the leather chairs. He himself took the other one, and, sipping his whisky and soda, he went on, "'No, I, uh, I haven't been the same man since.' "'You must miss her,' said Luke awkwardly. Major Horton shook his head darkly. "'Fellow needs a wife to keep him up to scratch,' he said. "'Otherwise he gets slack. Yes, slack. Let's himself go.' But surely— My boy, I know what I'm talking about. Mind you, I'm not saying marriage doesn't come hard on a fellow at first. It does. Fellow says to himself, Damn it all, he says. I can't call my soul my own. If he gets broken in, it's all discipline. Luke thought that Major Horton's married life must have been more like a military campaign than an idyll of domestic bliss. Women, soliloquized the Major, are a rum lot. It seems sometimes that there's no pleasing them. But by Jove, they keep a man up to the mark. Luke preserved a respectful silence. You married? inquired the Major. No. Ah, well, you'll come to it. And mind you, my boy, there's nothing like it. It's always cheering, said Luke, to hear someone speak well of the marriage state, especially in these days of easy divorce. Ha! said the Major. Young people make me sick. No stamina, no endurance. They can't stand anything. No fortitude. Luke itched to ask why such exceptional fortitude should be needed, but he controlled himself. Mind you, said the Major, Lydia was a woman in a thousand. In a thousand. Everyone here respected and looked up to her? Yes. She wouldn't stand any nonsense. She'd got a way of fixing a person with her eye, and the person wilted. Just wilted. Some of these half-baked girls who call themselves servants nowadays, they think you'll put up with any insolence. Lydia soon showed them. Do you know, we had fifteen cooks and house parlourmaids in one year. Fifteen! Luke felt that this was hardly a tribute to Mrs. Horton's domestic management, but since it seemed to strike his host differently, he merely murmured some vague remark. Turned him out neck and crop, she did, if they didn't suit. Was it always that way about? asked Luke. Well, of course, a lot of them walked out on us. And good riddance, that's what I say. That's what Lydia used to say. A fine spirit, said Luke. But wasn't it sometimes rather awkward? No, oh, I didn't mind turning to and putting my hand to things, said Horton. I'm a pretty fair cook, and I can lay a fire with anyone. I've never cared for washing up, but of course it's got to be done. You can't get away from that. Luke agreed that you couldn't. He asked whether Mrs. Horton had been good at domestic work. I'm not the sort of fellow to let his wife wait on him, said Major Horton. And anyway, Lydia was far too delicate to do any housework. She wasn't strong then. Major Horton shook his head. She had wonderful spirit. She wouldn't give in. But what that woman suffered. And no sympathy from the doctors either. Doctors are callous brutes. They only understand downright physical pain. Anything out of the ordinary is beyond most of them. Humbleby, for instance. Everyone seemed to think he was a good doctor. You don't agree? 
The man was an absolute ignoramus, knew nothing of modern discoveries. Doubt if he'd ever heard of a neurosis. He understood measles and mumps and broken bones all right, I suppose, but nothing else. Had a row with him in the end. He didn't understand Lydia's case at all. I gave it him straight from the shoulder, and he didn't like it. Got huffed and backed right out. Said I could send for any other doctor I chose. After that we had Thomas. You liked him better. Altogether a much cleverer man. If anyone could have pulled her through her last illness, Thomas would have done it. As a matter of fact, she was getting better. But she had a sudden relapse. Was it painful? Mm, yes. Gastritis. Acute pain. Sickness. All the rest of it. How that poor woman suffered. She was a martyr if ever there was one. And a couple of hospital nurses in the house who were about as sympathetic as a brace of grandfather clocks. The patient this and the patient that. The Major shook his head and drained his glass. Can't stand hospital nurses. So smug. Lydia insisted they were poisoning her. That wasn't true, of course. A regular sick fancy. Lots of people have it, so Thomas said. But there was this much truth behind it. Those women disliked her. That's the worst of women. Always down on their own sex. I suppose, said Luke, feeling that he was putting it awkwardly, but not seeing how to put it better, that Mrs. Horton had a lot of devoted friends in Witchwood. Oh, people were very kind, said the Major, somewhat grudgingly. Whitfield sent down grapes and peaches from his hothouse. And the old tabbies used to come and sit with her. Honoria Wainfleet and Lavinia Pinkerton. Miss Pinkerton came often, did she? Yes, regular old maid, but a kind creature. Very worried about Lydia, she was. Used to inquire into the diet and the medicines. All kindly meant, you know, but what I call a lot of fuss. Luke nodded comprehendingly. Can't stand fuss, said the Major. Too many women in this place. Difficult to get a decent game of golf. What about the young fellow at the antique shop, said Luke. The Major snorted. Oh, he doesn't play golf. Much too much of a Miss Nancy. Has he been in Witchwood long? About two years. Nasty sort of fellow. Hate those long-haired, purring chaps. Funnily enough, Lydia liked him. You can't trust women's judgment about men. They cottoned to some amazing bounders. She even insisted on taking some patent quack nostrum of his, stuff in a purple glass jar with signs of the zodiac all over it, supposed to be certain herbs picked at the full of the moon, lot of tomfoolery. But women swallow that stuff. Swallow it literally, too. <laughs> Luke said, feeling that he was changing the subject rather abruptly, but correctly judging that Major Horton would not be aware of the fact. What sort of fellow is... Abbott, the local solicitor. Pretty sound on the law? I've got to have some legal advice about something, and I thought I might go to him. Oh, they say he's pretty shrewd, acknowledged Major Horton. I don't know. Matter of fact, I've had a row with him. Not seen him since he came out here to make Lydia's will for her, and just uh, before she died. In my opinion, the man's a cad. But of course, he added, that doesn't affect his ability as a lawyer. No, of course not, said Luke. He seems a, a quarrelsome sort of man, though. Seems to have fallen out with a good many people, from what I hear. Trouble with him is that he's so confoundedly touchy, said Major Horton. Seems to think he's God Almighty, and that anyone who disagrees with him is committing less majesty. Heard of his row with Humbleby? Oh, they had a row, did they? First-class row. Mind you, that doesn't surprise me. Humbleby was an opinionated ass. Still, there it is. His death was very sad. Humblebys? Yes, I suppose it was. Lack of ordinary care. Blood poisoning's a damned dangerous thing. Always put iodine on a cut, I do. Simple precaution. Humbleby, who was a doctor, didn't do any of the sort. Just chose. Luke was not quite sure what it showed, but he let that pass. Glancing at his watch, he got up. Major Horton said, Getting on for lunchtime, so it is. Well, glad to have had a chat with you. Does me good to see a man who's been about the world a bit. We must have a yarn some other time. Where was your show? Mayang Straits? I've never been there. Here you're writing a book. Superstitions and all that. Yes, I... But Major Horton swept on. I can tell you some very interesting things. When I was in India, my boy... Luke escaped some ten minutes later after enduring the usual histories of fakirs, rope and mango tricks dear to the retired Anglo-Indian. As he stepped out into the open air and heard the Major's voice bellowing to Nero behind him, he marvelled at the miracle of married life. 
Major Horton seemed genuinely to regret a wife who, by all accounts, not excluding his own, must have been nearly allied to a man-eating tiger. Or was it? Luke asked himself the question suddenly. Was it an exceedingly clever bluff? Chapter 12 Passage of Arms The afternoon of the tennis party was fortunately fine. Lord Whitfield was in his most genial mood, acting the part of the host with a good deal of enjoyment. He referred frequently to his humble origin. The players were eight in all, Lord Whitfield, Bridget, Luke, Rose Humbleby, Mr. Abbott, Dr. Thomas, Major Horton, and Hetty Jones, a giggling young woman who was the daughter of the bank manager. In the second set of the afternoon, Luke found himself partnering Bridget against Lord Whitfield and Rose Humbleby. Rose was a good player, with a strong forehand drive, and played in county matches. She atoned for Lord Whitfield's failures. And Bridget and Luke, who were neither of them particularly strong, made quite an even match of it. They were three games all, and then Luke found a streak of erratic brilliance, and he and Bridget forged ahead to five-three. It was then he observed that Lord Whitfield was losing his temper. He argued over a line ball, declared a serve to be a fault, in spite of Rose's disclaimer, and displayed all the attributes of a peevish child. It was set point, but Bridget sent an easy shot into the net and immediately after served a double fault. Deuce. The next ball was returned down the middle line, and as he prepared to take it, he and his partner collided. Then Bridget served another double fault, and the game was lost. Bridget apologized. <laughs> Sorry, I've gone to pieces. It seemed true enough. Bridget's shots were wild, and she seemed to be unable to do anything right. The set ended with Lord Whitfield and his partner victorious, at the score of 8-6. There was a momentary discussion as to the composition of the next set. In the end, Rose played again with Mr. Abbott as her partner against Dr. Thomas and Miss Jones. Lord Whitfield sat down, wiping his forehead and smiling complacently, his good humour quite restored. He began to talk to Major Horton on the subject of a series of articles on fitness for Britain, which one of his papers was starring. Luke said to Bridget, Show me the kitchen garden. Why the kitchen garden? I have a feeling for cabbages. Won't green peas do? Green peas would be admirable. They walked away from the tennis court and came to the walled kitchen garden. It was empty of gardeners this Saturday afternoon and looked lazy and peaceful in the sunshine. Here are your peas, said Bridget. Luke paid no attention to the object of the visit. He said, Why the hell did you give them the set? Bridget's eyebrows went up a fraction. I'm sorry. I went to bits. My tennis is erratic. Not so erratic as that. Those double faults of yours wouldn't deceive a child. And those wild shots. Each of them half a mile out. Bridget said calmly, That's because I'm such a rotten tennis player. If I were a bit better... I could perhaps have made it a bit more plausible. But as it is, if I try to make a ball go just out, it's always on the line, and all the good work still to do. Oh, you admit it then. Obvious, my dear Watson. And the reason? Equally obvious, I would have thought. Gordon doesn't like losing. But well, what about me? Supposing I like to win? I'm afraid, my dear Luke, that that isn't equally important. Would you like to make your meaning just a little clearer still? Certainly, if you like. One mustn't quarrel with one's bread and butter. Gordon is my bread and butter. You are not. Luke drew a deep breath. Then he exploded. What the hell do you mean by marrying that absurd little man? Why are you doing it? Because as his secretary I get six pounds a week, and as his wife I shall get a hundred thousand settled on me, a jewel case full of pearls and diamonds, a handsome allowance, and various perquisites of the married state. But for somewhat different duties, Bridget said coldly, must we have this melodramatic attitude towards every single thing in life? If you're contemplating a pretty picture of Gordon as an uxorious husband, you can wash it right out. Gordon, as you should have realized, is a small boy who has not quite grown up. What he needs is a mother, not a wife, Unfortunately, his mother died when he was four years old. What he wants is someone at hand to whom he can brag, someone who will reassure him about himself and who is prepared to listen indefinitely to Lord Whitfield 
on the subject of himself. You've got a bitter tongue, haven't you? Bridget retorted sharply. I don't tell myself fairy stories, if that's what you mean. I'm a young woman, with a certain amount of intelligence, very moderate looks, and no money. I intend to earn an honest living. My job as Gordon's wife will be practically indistinguishable from my job as Gordon's secretary. After a year, I doubt if you'll remember to kiss me good night. The only difference is in the salary. They looked at each other. Both of them were pale with anger. Bridget said jeeringly, Go on. You're rather old-fashioned, aren't you, Mr. Fitzwilliam? Hadn't you better trot out the old clichés, say that I'm selling myself for money? That's always a good one, I think. Luke said, You're a cold-blooded little devil. That's better than being a hot-blooded little fool, is it? Yes, I know. Luke sneered, What do you know? I know what it is to care about a man. Did you ever meet Johnny Cornish? I was engaged to him for three years. He was adorable. I cared like hell about him, cared so much that it hurt. Well, he threw me over and married a nice, plump widow with a North Country accent and three chins and an income of thirty thousand a year. That sort of thing rather cures one of romance, don't you think? Luke turned away with a sudden groan. He said, It might. It did. There was a pause. The silence lay heavy between them. Bridget broke it at last. She said, but with a slight uncertainty in her tone, I hope you realize that you had no earthly right to speak to me as you did. You're staying in Gordon's house, and it's damn bad taste. Luke recovered his composure. Isn't that rather a cliché, too? he inquired politely. Bridget flushed. It's true, anyway. It isn't. I had every right. Nonsense. Luke looked at her. His face had a queer pallor, like a man who is suffering physical pain. He said, I have the right. I have the right of caring for you. What did you say just now? Of caring so much that it hurts. She drew back a step. She said, You? Yes. Funny, isn't it? The sort of thing that ought to give you a hearty laugh. I came down here to do a job of work, and you came round the corner of that house, and— How can I say it? Put a spell on me. That's what it feels like. You mentioned fairy stories just now. I'm caught up in a fairy story. You've bewitched me. I have a feeling that if you pointed your finger at me and said, Turn into a frog, I'd go hopping away with my eyes popping out of my head. He took a step nearer to her. I love you like hell, Bridget Conway. And loving you like hell, you can't expect me to enjoy seeing you get married to a pot-bellied, pompous little peer who loses his temper when he doesn't win at tennis. What do you suggest I should do? I suggest that you should marry me instead. But doubtless that suggestion will give rise to a lot of merry laughter. The laughter is positively uproarious. Exactly. Well, now we know where we are. Shall we return to the tennis court? Perhaps this time you will find me a partner who can play to win. Really? said Bridget sweetly. I believe you mind losing just as much as Gordon does. Luke caught her suddenly by the shoulders. You've got a devilish tongue, haven't you, Bridget? I'm afraid you don't like me very much, Luke, however great your passion for me. I don't think I like you at all. Bridget said, watching him. You meant to get married and settle down when you came home, didn't you? Yes but not to someone like me. I never thought of anyone in the least like you. No, you wouldn't. I know your type. I know it exactly. You are so clever, dear Bridget. A really nice girl, thoroughly English, fond of the country and good with dogs. You probably visualized her in a tweed skirt, stirring a log fire with the tip of her shoe. The picture sounds most attractive. I'm sure it does. Shall we return to the tennis court? You can play with Rose Humbleby. She's so good that you're practically certain to win. Being old-fashioned, I must allow you to have the last word. Again there was a pause. Then Luke took his hands slowly from her shoulders. They both stood uncertain, as though something still unsaid lingered between them. Then Bridget turned abruptly and led the way back. The next set was just ending. Rose protested against playing again. I've played two sets running. Bridget, however, insisted. I'm feeling tired. I don't want to play. You and Mr. Fitzwilliam take on Miss Jones and Major Horton. But Rose continued to protest. 
and in the end a men's four was arranged. Afterwards came tea. Lord Whitfield conversed with Dr. Thomas, describing at length, and with great self-importance, a visit he had recently paid to the Wellerman Kreitz Research Laboratories. "'I wanted to understand the trend of the latest scientific discoveries for myself,' he explained earnestly. "'I'm responsible for what my papers print. I feel that very keenly. This is a scientific age. Science must be made easily assimilable by the masses.' "'A little science might possibly be a dangerous thing.' said Dr. Thomas, with a slight shrug of his shoulders. "'Science in the home, that's what we have to aim at,' said Lord Whitfield. "'Science-minded?' "'Test-tube conscious,' said Bridget gravely. "'I was impressed,' said Lord Whitfield. "'Wellerman took me round himself. Of course, I begged him to leave me to an underling, but he insisted.' "'Naturally,' said Luke. Lord Whitfield looked gratified. "'And he explained everything most clearly.' the culture, the serum, the whole principle of the thing. He agreed to contribute the first article in the series himself. Mrs. Anstruther murmured, They use guinea pigs, I believe. So cruel. Though, of course, not so bad as dogs. Or even cats. Fellows who use dogs ought to be shot, said Major Horton hoarsely. I really believe, Horton, said Mr. Abbott, that you value canine life above human life. Every time, said the Major, Dogs can't turn round on you like human beings can. Never get a nasty word from a dog. Only a nasty tooth stuck into your leg, said Mr. Abbott. Eh, Horton? Dogs are a good judge of character, said Major Horton. One of your brutes nearly pinned me by the leg last week. What do you say to that, Horton? Same as I said just now. Bridget interposed tactfully. But what about some more tennis? A couple more sets were played. Then, as Rose Humbleby said goodbye, Luke appeared beside her. "'I'll see you home,' he said. "'And carry the tennis bat. You haven't got a car, have you?' "'No, but it's no distance. I'd like a walk.' He said no more, merely taking her racket and shoes from her. They walked down the drive without speaking. Then Rose mentioned one or two trivial matters. Luke answered rather shortly, but the girl did not seem to notice. As they turned into the gate of her house, Luke's face cleared. "'I'm feeling better now,' he said. "'Were you feeling badly before?' <sighs> "'Nice of you to pretend you didn't notice. "'You've exorcised the brute's sulky temper, though. "'Funny, I feel as though I'd come out of a dark cloud into the sun. "'So you have. "'There was a cloud over the sun when we left the manor, and now it's passed over. "'So it's literally as well as figuratively.' Well, well. The world's a good place after all. Of course it is. A Miss Humbleby, may I be impertinent? I'm sure you couldn't be. Oh, don't be too sure of that. I wanted to say that I think Dr. Thomas is a very lucky man. Rose blushed and smiled. She said, So you've heard. Was it supposed to be a secret? I'm so sorry. Oh, nothing is secret in this place said Rose ruefully. So it is true. You and he are engaged. Rose nodded. Only, just now, we're not announcing it officially. You see, Daddy was against it, and it seems, well, unkind to blazon it abroad the moment he's dead. Your father disapproved. Well, not disapproved, exactly. I suppose it did amount to that, really. Luke said gently, He thought you were too young. That's what he said. Luke said acutely, But you think there was something more than that? Rose bent her head slowly and reluctantly. Yes, I'm afraid what it really amounted to was that Daddy didn't, well, didn't really like Geoffrey. They were antagonistic to each other. It seemed like that sometimes. Of course, Daddy was a rather prejudiced old dear. And I suppose he was very fond of you and didn't like the thought of losing you. Rose assented, but still with a shade of reservation in her manner. It went deeper than that, asked Luke. He definitely didn't want Thomas as a husband for you. No. You see, Daddy and Geoffrey are, are so very unlike, and in some ways they clashed. Geoffrey was really very patient and good about it, but knowing Daddy didn't like him made him even more reserved and shy in his manner, so that Daddy really never got to know him any better. Prejudices are very hard to combat, 
said Luke. It was so completely unreasonable. Your father didn't advance any reasons. Oh, no. He couldn't. Naturally, I mean, there wasn't anything he could say against Geoffrey except that he didn't like him. I do not like thee, Dr. Fell. The reason why, I cannot tell. Exactly. No tangible thing to get hold of. I mean, your Geoffrey doesn't drink or back horses? No. I don't believe Geoffrey even knows what won the derby. That's funny, said Luke. You know, I could swear I saw your Dr. Thomas at Epsom, on Derby Day. For a moment, he was anxious, lest he might already have mentioned that he only arrived in England on that day, but Rose responded at once, quite unsuspiciously, You thought you saw Geoffrey at the Derby? Oh, no. He couldn't get away, for one thing. He was over at Ashwold nearly all that day, at a difficult confinement case. What a memory you've got. Rose laughed. I remember that, because he told me they called the baby Jujubi as a nickname. Luke nodded abstractedly. Anyway, said Rose, Geoffrey never goes to race meetings. He'd be bored to death. She added in a different tone. Won't you come in? I think Mother would like to see you. If you're sure of that. Rose led the way into a room where twilight hung rather sadly. A woman was sitting in an armchair in a curiously huddled-up position. Mother, this is Mr. Fitzwilliam. Mrs. Humbleby gave a start and shook hands. Rose went quietly out of the room. I'm glad to see you, Mr. Fitzwilliam. Some friends of yours knew my husband many years ago, so Rose tells me. Yes, Mrs. Humbleby. He rather hated repeating the lie to the widowed woman, but there was no way out of it. Mrs. Humbleby said, I wish you could have met him. He was a fine man and a great doctor. He cured many people who had been given up as hopeless just by the strength of his personality. Luke said gently, I've heard a lot about him since I've been here. I know how much people thought of him. He could not see Mrs. Humbleby's face very distinctly. Her voice was rather monotonous, but its very lack of feeling seemed to emphasize the fact that actually feeling was in her, strenuously held back. She said rather unexpectedly, The world is a very wicked place, Mr. Fitzwilliam. Do you know that? Luke was a little surprised. Yes, perhaps that may be, she insisted. No, but do you know it? It's important, that. There's a lot of wickedness about. One must be prepared to fight it. John was. He knew. He was on the side of the right. Luke said gently, I'm sure he was. He knew the wickedness there was in this place, said Mrs. Humbleby. He knew. She suddenly burst into tears. Luke murmured, I'm so sorry, and stopped. She controlled herself as suddenly as she had lost control. Y you must forgive me, she said. She held out her hand and he took it. Do come and see us while you are here, she said. It would be so good for Rose. She likes you so much. I like her. I think your daughter is the nicest girl I've met for a long time, Mrs. Humbleby. She's very good to me. Dr. Thomas is a very lucky man. Yes. Mrs. Humbleby dropped his hand. Her voice had gone flat again. I don't know. It's all so difficult. Luke left her standing in the half-gloom her fingers nervously twisting and untwisting themselves. As he walked home, his mind went over various aspects of the conversation. Dr. Thomas had been absent from Witchwood for a good part of Derby Day. He had been absent in a car. Witchwood was thirty-five miles from London. Supposedly, he had been attending a confinement case. Was there more than his word? The point, he supposed, could be verified. His mind went on to Mrs. Humbleby. What did she meant by her insistence on that phrase, there's a lot of wickedness about? Was she just nervous and overwrought by the shock of her husband's death, or was there something more to it than that? Did she perhaps know something, something that Dr. Humbleby had known before he died? I've got to go on with this, said Luke to himself. I've got to go on. Resolutely, he averted his mind from the passage of arms that had taken place 
between him and Bridget. Chapter 13 Miss Wainfleet Talks On the following morning, Luke came to a decision. He had, he felt, proceeded as far as he could with indirect inquiries. It was inevitable that sooner or later he would be forced out into the open. He felt that the time had come to drop the book-writing camouflage and reveal that he had come to Witchwood with a definite aim in view. In pursuance of this plan of campaign, he decided to call upon Honoria Wainfleet. Not only had he been favorably impressed by that middle-aged spinster's air of discretion and a certain shrewdness of outlook, but he fancied that she might have information that would help him. He believed that she had told him what she knew. He wanted to induce her to tell him what she might have guessed. He had a shrewd idea that Miss Wainfleet's guesses might be fairly near the truth. He called immediately after church. Miss Wainfleet received him in a matter-of-fact manner, showing no surprise at his call. As she sat down near him, her prim hands folded, and her intelligent eyes, so like an amiable goat's, fixed on his face, he found little difficulty in coming to the object of his visit. He said, I dare say you have guessed, Miss Wainfleet, that the reason of my coming here is not merely to write a book on local customs. Miss Wainfleet inclined her head and continued to listen. Luke was not minded as yet to go into the full story. Miss Wainfleet might be discreet, she certainly gave him the impression of being so, but where an elderly spinster was concerned, Luke felt he could hardly rely on her resisting the temptation to confide an exciting story to one or two trusted cronies. He thereupon proposed to adopt a middle course. I'm down here to inquire into the circumstances of the death of that poor girl Amy Gibbs. Miss Wainfleet said, You mean you've been sent down by the police? Oh, no, I'm not a plain-clothes dick he added, with a slightly humorous inflection. I'm afraid I'm that well-known character in fiction, the private investigator. I see. Then it was Bridget Conway who brought you down here. Luke hesitated for a moment. Then he decided to let it go at that. Without going into the whole Pinkerton story, it was difficult to account for his presence. Miss Wainfleet was continuing, a note of gentle admiration in her voice. Bridget is so practical, so efficient. I'm afraid if it had been left to me, I should have distrusted my own judgment. I mean, that if you are not absolutely sure of a thing, it is so difficult to commit yourself to a definite course of action. But you are sure, aren't you? Miss Wainfleet said gravely, No, indeed, Mr. Fitzwilliam. It is not a thing one can be sure about. I mean, it might all be imagination. Living alone, with no one to consult or to talk to— one might easily become melodramatic and imagine things which had no foundation in fact. Luke assented readily to this statement, recognizing its inherent truth. But he added gently, But you're sure in your own mind. Even here, Miss Wainfleet showed a little reluctance. We are not talking at cross purposes, I hope, she demurred. Luke smiled. Would you like me to put it in plain words? Very well. You do think that Amy Gibbs was murdered? Honoria Wainfleet flinched a little at the crudity of the language. She said, I don't feel at all happy about her death. Not at all happy. The whole thing is profoundly unsatisfactory, in my opinion. Luke said patiently, But you don't think her death was a natural one? No. You don't believe it was an accident? It seems to me most improbable. There are so many— Luke cut her short. You don't think it was suicide? Emphatically not. Then, said Luke gently, you do think that it was murder. Miss Wainfleet hesitated, gulped, and bravely took the plunge. Yes, she said, I do. Good. Now we can get on with things. But I have no real evidence on which to base that belief, Miss Wainfleet explained anxiously. It is entirely an idea. Quite so. This is a private conversation. We are merely speaking about what we think and suspect. We suspect Amy Gibbs was murdered. Who do we think murdered her? Miss Wainfleet shook her head. She was looking very troubled. Luke said, watching her, Who had reason to murder her? Miss Wainfleet said slowly, She had had a quarrel, I believe, with her young man at the garage. 
Jim Harvey, a most steady, superior young man. I know one reads in the papers of young men attacking their sweethearts and dreadful things like that, but I really can't believe that Jim would do such a thing. Luke nodded. Miss Wainfleet went on. Besides, I can't believe that he would do it that way. Climb up to her window and substitute a bottle of poison for the other one with the cough mixture? I, I mean, that doesn't seem— Luke came to the rescue as she hesitated. It's not the act of an angry lover, I agree. In my opinion, we can wash Jim Harvey right out. Amy was killed, and we'll agree that she was killed, by someone— who wanted to get her out of the way, and who planned the crime carefully so that it should appear to be an accident. Now, have you any idea, any hunch, shall we put it like that, who that person could be? Miss Wainfleet said, No. Really, no, I haven't the least idea. Sure? No. No, indeed. Luke looked at her thoughtfully. The denial, he felt, had not rung quite true. He went on, you know of no motive. No motive whatever. That was more emphatic. Had she been in many places in Witchwood? She was with the Hortons for a year before going to Lord Whitfield. Luke summed up rapidly. It's like this, then. Somebody wanted that girl out of the way. From the given facts, we assume that, first, it was a man, and a man of moderately old-fashioned outlook, as shown by the hat-paint touch and secondly, that it must have been a reasonably athletic man, since it is clear he must have climbed up over the outhouse to the girl's window. You agree on those points? Absolutely, said Miss Wainfleet. Do you mind if I go round and have a try myself? Not at all. I think it is a very good idea. She led him out by a side door and round to the back yard. Luke managed to reach the outhouse roof without much trouble, from there he could easily raise the sash of the girl's window, and with a slight effort hoist himself into the room. A few minutes later he rejoined Miss Wainfleet on the path below, wiping his hands on his handkerchief. Actually, it's easier than it looks, he said. You want a certain amount of muscle, that's all. There were no signs on the sill or outside? Miss Wainfleet shook her head. I don't think so. Of course, the constable climbed up this way so that if there were any traces, they would be taken to be his. How the police force assists the criminal. Well, that's that. Miss Wainfleet led the way back to the house. Was Amy Gibbs a heavy sleeper? he asked. Miss Wainfleet replied acidly. It was extremely difficult to get her up in the morning. Sometimes I would knock again and again, and call out to her before she answered. But then, you know, Mr. Fitzwilliam— there is a saying, there are none so deaf as those who will not hear. And that's true, acknowledged Luke. Well now, Miss Wainfleet, we come to the question of motive. Starting with the most obvious one, do you think there was anything between that fellow Ellsworthy and the girl? He added hastily, this is just your opinion I'm asking, only that. If it's a matter of opinion, I would say yes, Luke nodded. In your opinion, would the girl Amy have stuck at a spot of blackmail? Again, as a matter of opinion, I should say that that was quite possible. Do you happen to know if she had much money in her possession at the time of her death? Miss Wainfleet reflected. I do not think so. If she had had any unusual amount, I think I should have heard about it. And she hadn't launched into any unusual extravagance before she died? I don't think so. That rather militates against the blackmail theory. The victim usually pays once before he decides to proceed to extremes. There's another theory. The girl might know something. What kind of thing? She might have knowledge that was dangerous to someone here in Witchwood. We'll take a strictly hypothetical case. She'd been in service in a good many houses here. Supposing she came to know of something that would damage, say, someone like Mr. Abbott, professionally. Mr. Abbott? Luke said quickly, or possibly some negligence or unprofessional conduct on the part of Dr. Thomas. Miss Wainfleet began, But surely— and then stopped. Luke went on, Amy Gibbs was housemaid, you said, in the Horton's house at the time when Mrs. Horton died. There was a moment's pause. 
Then Miss Wainfleet said, Will you tell me, Mr. Fitzwilliam, why you bring the Hortons into this? Mrs. Horton died over a year ago. Yes, and the girl Amy was there at the time. I see. What have the Hortons to do with it? I don't know. I, I just wondered. Mrs. Horton died of acute gastritis, didn't she? Yes. Was her death at all unexpected? Miss Wainfleet said slowly, It was to me. You see, she had been getting much better, seemed well on the road to recovery, and then she had a sudden relapse and died. Was Dr. Thomas surprised? I don't know. I believe he was. And the nurses, what did they say? In my experience, said Miss Wainfleet, hospital nurses are never surprised at any case taking a turn for the worse. It is recovery that surprises them. But her death surprised you, Luke persisted. Yes, I had been with her only the day before, and she seemed very much better, talked and seemed quite cheerful. What did she think about her own illness? She complained that the nurses were poisoning her. She had had one nurse sent away, but she said these two were just as bad. I suppose you didn't pay much attention to that. Well, no, I thought it was all part of the illness. And she was a very suspicious woman, and, it may be unkind to say so, but she liked to make herself important. No doctor ever understood her case, and it was never anything simple. It must be either some very obscure disease, or else somebody was trying to get her out of the way. Luke tried to make his voice sound casual. She didn't suspect her husband of trying to do her in? Oh, no. That idea never occurred to her. Miss Wainfleet paused a minute. Then she asked quietly, Is that what you think? Luke said slowly, Husbands have done that before and got away with it. Mrs. Horton, from all accounts, was a woman any man might have longed to be rid of. And I understand that he came into a good deal of money on her death. Yes, he did. What do you think, Miss Wainfleet? You want my opinion? Yes, just your opinion. Miss Wainfleet said quietly and deliberately, In my opinion, Major Horton was quite devoted to his wife and would never have dreamed of doing such a thing. Luke looked at her and received the mild amber glance in reply. It did not waver. Well, he said, I expect you're right. You'd probably know if it was the other way round. Miss Wainfleet permitted herself a smile. We women are good observers, you think? Absolutely first class. Would Miss Pinkerton have agreed with you, do you think? I don't think I ever heard Lavinia express an opinion. What did you think about Amy Gibbs? Miss Wainfleet frowned a little, as though thinking, It's difficult to say. Lavinia had a very curious idea. A what idea? She thought that there was something odd going on here in Witchwood. She thought, for instance, that somebody pushed Tommy Pierce out of that window. Miss Wainfleet stared at him in astonishment. How did you know that, Mr. Fitzwilliam? She told me so. Not in these words, but she gave me the general idea. Miss Wainfleet leant forward, pink with excitement. When was this, Mr. Fitzwilliam? Luke said quietly, the day she was killed. We travelled together to London. What did she tell you exactly? She told me that there had been too many deaths in Witchwood. She mentioned Amy Gibbs and Tommy Pierce and that man Carter. She also said that Dr. Humbleby would be the next to go. Miss Wainfleet nodded slowly. Did she tell you who was responsible? A man with a certain look in his eyes, said Luke grimly, a look you couldn't mistake, according to her. She'd seen that look in his eye when he was talking to Humbleby. That's why she said Humbleby would be the next to go. And he was, whispered Miss Wainfleet. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. She leaned back. Her eyes had a stricken look in them. Who was the man, said Luke. Come now, Miss Wainfleet. You know, you must know. I don't. She didn't tell me, but you can guess, said Luke keenly. You've a very shrewd idea of who was in her mind. Reluctantly, Miss Wainfleet bowed her head. Then tell me. But Miss Wainfleet shook her head energetically. No, indeed. You're asking me to do something that is highly improper. You're asking me to guess 
at what may, only may, mind you, have been in the mind of a friend who is now dead, I couldn't make an accusation of that kind. It wouldn't be an accusation, only an opinion. But Miss Wainfleet was unexpectedly firm. I've nothing to go on, nothing whatever, she said. Lavinia never actually said anything to me. I may think she had a certain idea, but you see I might be entirely wrong. And then I should have misled you, and perhaps serious consequences might ensue. It would be very wicked and unfair of me to mention a name, and I might be quite, quite wrong. In fact, I probably am wrong. And Miss Wainfleet set her lips firmly and glared at Luke with grim determination. Luke knew how to accept defeat when he met it. He realized that Miss Wainfleet's sense of rectitude and something else more nebulous that he could not quite place were both against him. He accepted defeat with a good grace and rose to say goodbye. He had every intention of returning to the charge later, but he allowed no hint of that to escape into his manner. You must do as you think right, of course, he said. Thank you for the help that you've given me. Miss Wainfleet seemed to become a little less sure of herself as she accompanied him to the door. I hope you don't think, she began, then changed the form of her sentence. If there is anything else I can do to help you, please, please let me know. I will. You won't repeat this conversation, will you? Of course not. I shan't say a word to anybody. Luke hoped that that was true. Give my love to Bridget, said Miss Wainfleet. She's such a handsome girl, isn't she? And clever, too. I, I hope she will be happy. And as Luke looked a question, she added, Married to Lord Whitfield, I mean. Such a great difference in age. Yes, there is. Miss Wainfleet sighed. You know that I was engaged to him once, she said, unexpectedly. Luke stared in astonishment. She was nodding her head and smiling rather sadly. A long time ago, he was such a promising boy. I had helped him, you know, to educate himself. And I was so proud of his spirit and the way he was determined to succeed. She sighed again. My people, of course, were scandalized. Class distinctions in those days were very strong. She added after a minute or two. I've always followed his career with great interest. My people, I think, were wrong. Then, with a smile, she nodded a farewell and went back into the house. Luke tried to collect his thoughts. He had placed Miss Wainfleet as definitely old. He realized now that she was probably still under sixty. Lord Whitfield must be well over fifty. She might perhaps be a year or two older than he, no more. And he was going to marry Bridget. Bridget, who was twenty-eight. Bridget, who was young and alive. Oh, damn, said Luke. Don't let me go on thinking of it. The job. Get on with the job.